Hey everybody, welcome back to the MedBears channel and in today's video we are going to be doing an ethics sort of discussion. So uh, Herman, why don't you introduce what exactly we're doing here. So what we're going to be doing today is I have come up with some really hard ethics questions, really serious dilemmas doctors have to face. Sometimes it's unprecedented on what has happened before and I'm going to pose it to these guys and they're going to try to answer the best of their ability. I want you out there to answer as well. Put it in the comments down below. Let's see if you were correct. These are pretty crazy. So let's jump into case number one. Okay. You guys ready? How do you guys yeah. feel about this? Have you ever had to face ethical dilemmas? Yeah, I think there is training like this in medical school, but um, let's just see where this goes. This might go in a uh, quite divergent we've direction. We've never heard these before. Yeah, yeah, we've never heard these before. These are before. brand new and some of them are really hard. So let's get into case number one. So there is a doctor that has a disease that interferes with his ability to treat patients. That is the premise of the case. Okay. So there's an anesthesiology. He's on staff at a hospital. He went to see a fellow doctor as a patient. So you are now in the position of that fellow doctor seeing this anesthesiologist. Okay. He, this anesthesiologist was having brief lapses of consciousness related to complex partial seizures, a mm. form of epilepsy that has gone unrecognized during his residency. So he didn't know he had okay. it. He admitted to having at least one seizure in the OR that was so brief that no one observed it. The condition was treatable but left the second doctor uncertain about whether to uphold, that's the second doctor you guys, mm. you are uncertain about whether to uphold the privacy of the doctor-patient relationship or do you inform the hospital staff. Let's give you guys a second to think about it and I mean a second. start with Bunny. Obviously, anything that interferes... Okay, it's not obvious. This is me being good. This is a little bit of a discrepancy yeah, here, though. sure. But I personally think anything that could potentially cause damage to patients, you have to report it. Personally. Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. Imagine so, if they, he has a more intense seizure in the OR. Like, what are you going to do? Kill the patient? Like, just to uphold some HIPAA? Like, of course, HIPAA is very important. It's, very, it's a huge priority. But I would never prioritize it over another patient's health. Okay, first impressions, Shaman, you? Yeah, I think that's a general principle. I think HIPAA is definitely really important, but I think there is points where HIPAA is, goes overruled. too far. Yeah, hope, HIPAA should be overruled in certain instances. Mm -hmm. And uh, that is like, we are taught that. And so I think in this case, if, especially in like the OR, if it's like, it depends on what case it is, how common it is. Obviously you wanna look into more specifics if this was our actual real scenario. It's like I would wanna know so much more details, but from a general overview, it seems like it has the possibility to cause harm to patients, so I would have to report it. So what would be your exact first steps? Who would you go to? Who would you report it to? Shaman, start us off. Uh, first, I would be honest and open with the uh, doctor slash patient um, and tell him what I'm gonna do, tell him what his thoughts are, get his input. And um, from there, after I do that, I would probably, um, so you said he's an anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. right? Say very important, like Shaman said, you talk to the uh, patient, he's your patient, and tell him exactly what you're gonna do, and then I would go to his employer. Um, I wouldn't report him to the boards, I would just go to the employer, let him know what the situation is and how he may potentially be a danger um, to his patients due to this condition. Not tell him more than that, like not more history than is necessary. Just pretty much say that he may have something that, uh, if, if you could also get consent from the patient, like how much can I share? Like, should I say that, um, you know, you have these mild seizures or do you just want to leave it like, okay, there's something impaired, whatever he describes and then go to the employer and then have the employer take care of it. And most likely the employer is going to put him on leave or something. Very good. So I will give you guys the exact scenario of what is optimally what you're told to do. So right, the next best step would be as a doctor to have a discussion with the anesthesiologist and let them know, look, this is a dangerous condition. I'm going to give you a chance to report yourself. That's very important in this case, considering if you just go and report them, it might yeah, scare other sure. doctors yeah, in the future. Mm -hmm. So you must uh, kind of encourage the patient to go out and, or doctor in this case, to mm -hmm. go and report mm -hmm. himself. The outcome of this particular case, these are all real cases, by the way, guys. Uh, the anesthesiologist's condition was treatable. His doctor told him it was serious enough that he could not honor his privacy if the anesthesiologist did not notify his chairman. Mm -hmm. The anesthesiologist notified his chairman and resigned his position. Mm -hmm. A note in his file ensured that this information would be forwarded to any hospital he might apply to in a future condition yeah. uh, position. It would be up to the hospital. To, it would be up to the hospital to further evaluate the anesthesiologist to see if he was capable of working safely with patients. So this would give, uh, let me just drop that into you guys as an additional question, which was not addressed here. Would you allow this person to work? I would. I, well, it depends on in what setting, right? So 
Um, like I would give him a position that isn't that acute. Maybe not even like OR related. If I can find a job for him outside of the OR, especially outside of like acute cases. Um, oh, he's that an would... anesthesiologist. So how is he going to be outside the OR? Well, well like he can, like, I don't know. Again, we can find something like pre-op. Pain, pain management, yeah. pre-op. Positions. Yeah, like there's tons of yeah, things that true. you can do that. Or I was thinking maybe just having him always work with a CRNA. Uh, that's another thought I would have as well. Somebody to constantly be there just to specifically monitor him would be another solution to this Yeah, problem. so definitely I would not just fire him and get rid yeah. of him. I would find another role uh, for him. Case number two, where we get into some family matters. This is when things in ethics usually get pretty dicey. So this is a family that's fighting over con continuing their mother's care. Very common case. Very common. A mother of four children entered into the hospital after suffering a massive stroke and was put on a ventilator. You might have lots of stories like this going on right now with COVID. Yep. Doctors believe that she would not regain brain function. One of her sons got to the hospital first and told the doctors that should his mother suffer heart failure or any other irreversible complication, no measures should be taken to save her life, aka make her DNR DNI. Mm -hmm. Doctors worked under that assumption until one of the woman's daughters arrived and claimed that her brother wasn't interested in helping their mother. He had pushed to put their mother in a nursing home, the sister said, and added that she wanted to do everything possible to extend her mother's life. The mother was widowed and hadn't specified which of her children was to make the decision on her behalf. The doctor has to choose which wishes to follow. What do you do? Now we get dicey, folks. Get in the comments below. <laughs> yeah, if you have uh, responses, type them in before we tell what we would think. That yeah. makes it more interesting. Well, there's like an actual course of action you usually do so you usually look to see um if they have some sort of living will present exactly. if they have um some sort of documentation stating what they um usually though if they come into the hospital the first thing you do even if they have documentation is figure out what their dnr dni status is in the hospital and usually patients will say i already have a living will you still you just ask them what they want Absolutely. for this day then if that fails then you look to spouse like her said she's widowed so that's okay knocked out then you go to kids um, adult children um, and now we have a conflict with adult children and I'm assuming you don't have a living will I'm assuming now she doesn't have a husband either um, and if it was up to me and I had you know, how old is she said uh, the mother is 65 oh I think I would see so, all this has been altered for patient safety but let, roughly yeah 65. no I think I would consider her um, full resuscitation full intubation status so, okay, so you would go along with the wishes of the yes. daughter that came in. Yeah. Okay, and your reasoning being? My reasoning is that you don't have anything to consider otherwise other than a son who we're having conflicting opinions about. And what are you going to do? The only other option is, okay, she could die? Like, I think that's far worse of an outcome than the latter. Yeah, so you're putting up to uh, debate the yes, outcomes of in, life, in an death. alternative, what if she didn't want that and then right. now you killed her? Like, exactly, an alternative keeping worse. her alive is, yeah, is far yeah. worse than the Shaman? Yeah, so I think Benit gave a really excellent Very response, uh, like basically re really thorough. I will say one of the things that you can also do if you're really um, like interested, again, this is a common thing that's asked Very. every time you go into the hospital, like, a random patient who has like no chance of dying still gets asked if they're they want to be do not resuscitated or intubated and so often and i actually did this on my team um during my rotations they'll be like hey um shaman can you go look into like past medical records or past mm. hospital visits and see what she said because this is a pretty common question and it probably is in there at least at the hospitals that i was rotating at mm -hmm. um so that's the only thing i would add on to panit's answer otherwise really good and uh, I agree with the what you said was the conclusion as well. If there's one kid that doesn't want her resuscitated and one kid that does, um, the default would be to resuscitate her. Yeah. Okay, this is gonna be interesting to read the answer to this, guys. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even expecting this answer. So without a spouse involved, like Beneath mentioned, next would be spouse, mm -hmm. but then you go to children. So without a spouse, the response- Oh, the parents? Is that the one thing? No, I know, guys, I know you can go to the parents. You can go to the parents, but, but in, in this case, there are, 65, there are none, right? Yeah, there yeah. are none. And children come before uh, the parents. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so without a spouse involved, the responsibility for end of life decision falls on the patient's children and without a designated healthcare proxy in place, all the children hold equal weight. In cases like this, very interestingly, 
Doctors have to focus on what the patient, not her children, will want. Yes. yes. That means exactly. looking for examples of substituted judgment or statements that the patient may have made yes. that gave clues about her wishes. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. If while watching benign things, things you wouldn't even uh, you know really consider in a medical setting, you would think in a legal setting, but would uphold if the patient was watching ER and she randomly just commented, I'd rather be unplugged than being in a vegetative state, you can literally bring that kind of information to the table, which will have significant weight as to causing an outcome. So everyone would be asked in this situation, everyone that knows her, to give their recollections okay, about her. I yeah. agree <laughs> technically with that answer, yeah. but let's be real. Yeah. They're not going to be like, you know what, Timmy? Yeah, exactly. You're right. Mom did say she wanted to die based <laughs> off that one exactly. night in August. So yeah. in a practical world, I yeah. don't think that really So do you guys, yeah. These are theoretical okay. answers, and yeah, these are examples, but from the hospitals that I did rotate in, uh, yeah, they you they do follow these guidelines to an extent, but also they use common sense. Yes. And if there's one daughter that's like, "Don't let my mom die," don't they usually? And there's maybe one brother that's like, "Nah, actually, you can let her go." They'll uh, they will intubate or resuscitate. Yeah, something. and obviously everything is explored, even with some subjectivity. For example, did he have a bad relationship the son with the mother? Like, there's a couple of like subjective things that probably the doctor would also listen to. Not necessarily be like, okay, that's why, but like you want to get the whole picture of like why are you saying that she's DNR on DNI? Why are you saying that she's you know like what what do you have as backup? All right, let's get this even more interesting. So, do you guys know what the next step is? Say family members just can't agree, they can't yeah, you come call up with the election. ethics committee. The ethics committee. Nobody which is ever does. never a right answer even on these <laughs> questions or anything, but that would be finally a right answer here if they can't come to anything. And then the ethics committee would get involved. Now, I think we might have lost over this point, Benita, I understood what you were saying with you life over that, but did you read the part where they said that she's brain dead? Okay, did so you she's on a ventilator. You never she, said that. Oh, did I? Did you I skipped it? Uh, I said I might have read it a little too fast. Doctors believe that she would not regain brain function, so she is. Oh, that changed. That changed. Yeah, that's why I wasn't paying too did much attention. Did you say that? I might have glossed over. I very missed quickly. that as well. So, so she that. is. She, so she is. No, not. I just thought when you're was... brain dead, doctors can cut the plug. Yes, doctors can eventually make. The but decision. again, if the daughter is really begging, no, you the still doctors can just. They can, but would they? I think they. I think doctors are a little more on the What do you think, Sean? Would you have your resources? Like, again, it's all about the resources in the end of the day. Okay, Hospital is just like any other yeah. resource-driven entity. Again, if the daughter is asking me not to, then... I, how long I, the patient is brain dead? I would cut the Well, it, again, I'd have to look into this. Why is she brain dead? They she, said that she's not going to gain Yeah, she brain came function. in uh, massive stroke, brain dead. Um, and from my own personal experience and all the data out there very very low percentage of people make it back from this kind of massive stroke uh brain dead picture it has happened of course there are people who have been in vegetative state for years and years and years and then all of a sudden they regain consciousness and some of that stuff definitely medicine doesn't even understand yet but for the vast majority uh brain dead means brain dead. yeah i agree so what would be your beneath your? I would say at that point, yeah, I didn't hear that. Part. Yeah, I, I must have. That's ventilated. why I must have lost. Okay, but you still wouldn't just uh, pull, the, pull the plug. You would probably involve the ethics committee in this situation, right, and get right. them to make a decision. Right, exactly. But Benice's right in that the doctor can make the final decision and say. Enough is yeah, enough. Yeah, I think so. I so, think, yeah. let me tell you guys about the outcome. Very interesting. This is what I said. The family ones get a little dicey everywhere. Until the legal and ethical issues could be resolved, the ethics teams told the children that a do not resuscitate order would not be put in place. They also told the children that there was nothing more they could do for the mother to reverse her condition. In the course of the consultation, the siblings discussed how their mother responded to the Terry Schiavo case. They remember their mothers thought that it was terrible. They should let that girl die in peace. They recalled her saying. Everyone, including the sister who had initially rejected the idea, agreed that the mother should not be resuscitated in the case, that her heart failed, she died shortly thereafter. So you were actually correct. You would choose life, same thing with Shaman. You wouldn't immediately pull the plug. You you guys were absolutely on the right track. Keep their non, uh, do not resuscitate order would not be put in place. She'd still remain resuscitate uh, in case her heart or anything stopped. And they kind of sorted it out and came to a conclusion finally. Uh, but if the conclusion does not get made, then Benita, you're absolutely right as well. The doctors can say the resources are not for anything and pull the plug themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Although I, I do have to rewind the tape and see if this guy mentions. I, <laughs> I read it a little too fast. I have a list, folks. Um, also, I was going to say that I think there's a huge amount of actually influence and um, 
responsibility on doctors more than people realize oh, yeah. and how much influence they can have on convincing patients to go DNR, DNI, and vice versa. Oh, right, and right. that's unfortunately a conversation I have not mastered or even gotten close to, but it is really common and you can actually sway families. So Right, even myself as an intern, I've already been through the CCU countless, countless family meetings already on whether what post of uh, the DNR yeah, status, who gets ventilators, things like that. It is absolutely insane right now. So let's move on to the third case and this is where we get interesting with this case, okay? A girlfriend wants to receive her dying boyfriend's sperm. <laughs> well, let's yeah. just jump into it. A 25-year-old man was out drinking with his friends when he fell and hit his head on the bar. He was rushed to the hospital. Doctors discovered he had severe swelling and bleeding from the brain. Before the doctors declared him legally brain dead, the man's girlfriend arrived and asked for a testicular biopsy. Interesting. She wanted to retrieve his sperm before he died so she could conceive his child. Wow. The doctors had to decide whether the patient would be granted her request. This is a fascinating case. What do you guys immediately have impressions on? Wow. It's, it's funny, but also, would you do the same no, thing? Yeah. It's something that, yeah, Definitely very interesting, interesting uh, proposition. Thing that never on. has come up before in my experience. Yeah. First impressions, what do you think? We are the doctor standing there and she comes in. Shaman. I feel bad for Oh, it's beneath. No, Shaman. Shaman, go ahead. I feel bad for Again, I would, because when you're a doctor you're always looking out for your patient and in this case your patient is the one who's brain dead if i'm if you read it correctly this no, time no i think he died right is he dead now He's or brain- he is going to be determined brain dead not yet they haven't determined okay. him but he has it Herman, says here, here's where, where doctors discovered he had severe swelling before the doctors declared him legally brain dead. Oh, the man's okay. girlfriend arrived, so he's not okay. legally declared. Okay, but yet, he's but he's, he's yeah. in dire straits here. You don't look too uh, again, but he's your patient, so you need to look out for the wishes of him. Mm-hmm. So if there is evidence of him saying, "Let I really want a kid with you," or um, like if this happens to me, then get a biopsy or whatever. Uh, then in that case, <laughs> in that case if there is evidence presented um maybe again i'd have to look at more details i'd have to uh, see like uh i probably involved the ethics committee again um but um if there's no guy who calls the ethics get the ethics committee committee. get the ethics committee (laughs) if there's uh no evidence of that or even weak evidence then i would not do it okay but what would you do um, similar to Shaman, like, I think it's a really great point Shaman brought up that at the end of the day, your patient is your priority and, um, I'd probably involve parents because she's asking for a lot. So, well, I don't know if I would involve parents because that's HIPAA. So. I would probably. I would, but again, this would, in point. general, I would say that this is not going to happen in the vast majority of cases, but if all these pieces align, I would have to get a lot of people involved. I would have to see evidence. Maybe, but I've never seen this before and I'm leaning towards no, but keep going. I would probably say that if we have not determined him brain dead, I don't want to go to any real decisions until I... That's true. That is a great point. Because you can still retrieve his sperm when he's brain dead. If there's a chance he's going to come back, then I wouldn't want to do that biopsy because you're consenting somebody to a procedure that they have not consented. That is also true. And I would look who's his power of attorney to make this decision for him? Is she his power of attorney in the in the case that he is brain dead to do something like this? Um, otherwise she can't give consent to a procedure for him. Um, I would just wait until like we figure out he's vegetated. If he's vegetated and like Shaman said, I'd probably need to see evidence of some yeah. sort of- Yeah, so I think overall we're leading on this. From what we've weeded out, there's too many- the yeah, there's, there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's too many variables that need to line up that is so it's probably going to be a no it's a but no let's say if there is some evidence saying like if i fall <laughs> off a bike and get into a vegetative state please perform this biopsy <laughs> sign <laughs> maybe in that case but otherwise this is a no for me okay very interesting you say that yeah. so so let's get into this one the first thing to determine is does the man have an end of life plan in place does it mention anything about his girlfriend the man has no such plan in this case the question then becomes was there any reason that he would give his girlfriend uh his 
sperm. I was trying to look up for any other word that wouldn't be derogatory, but they're all bad. Okay. The girlfriend would have little claim to the patient's sperm uh, unless there is compelling evidence about this man's desire to participate in his own posthumous reproduction. Exactly what I said. Exactly. If there is a written document about it, such as, like Shaman said, if I uh, pass out drunk and one night hit my head, you'd have my sperm, that's a different story. But if it's just her saying that to you, it doesn't, it's not said, even if she remembered a conversation like that, you can't. That doesn't mean you. That's what I was just about to say. Yeah, unless yeah, I said evidence. if it's written evidence, that's yeah, fine. Yeah, exactly. But if it's if it's, if it's just yeah, if it's just verbal or oral, uh, if it's just verbally said and she's just telling you, oh, this is what he told me. That is not clear evidence of the patient's wishes, because you might be already now guessing with these ethics things. How do you know if, like in that previous question, mom really said that about mm -hmm. that during the oh. ER show? Mm -hmm. It's not clear evidence. Read the last <laughs> so basically, okay. I got it exactly. I like right. the last sentence. Just read the last. Sentence. <laughs> oh, exactly. No, that's what I was saying. So the key is why you have to be very careful with some of these access questions. Stuff will happen out of left field that you would never even expect. So let's say that the girlfriend managed to go ahead and secure the sperm and has a child and has an heir of this individual. This heir is now entitled legally to the patient's part of the patient's estate just due to legal inheritance. And uh, yeah, you just gave uh, the state away to somebody that just sneaked that right out uh, from under you. So a lot of stuff that you have to take into account. So obviously what happened was there was no end of life plan in place. The final decision fell to the man's family who were initially open to the retrieval as a way to continue their son's legacy. The ethics team then met and explained their concerns about the girlfriend's request. They also suggested that another way of giving new life was through organ donation. The patient was officially really declared brain dead later that day. The girlfriend and parents thought about the decision overnight and came to the conclusion that they didn't want to harvest sperm. Instead, they consented to organ donation That's and after awesome. the ventilator was discontinued, the man's organs were transplanted into That's four really people. Cool. That's really cool your way to kind of solve. Did, your ethics the, committee did something. <laughs> they came to the rescue again. The ethics community, man. I gotta go meet these people in my hospital. I've never um, even seen them. We kind of just take I also, it. guys, one thing to know is when we are, I feel like every answer for this video, me and Sean are gonna be very wishy-washy because at the end of the day, Maybe he did say that, but you can't be insensitive to someone, even if it sounds like an outrageous request, to someone who's like very vulnerable coming in. So like even though mine and Shaman both got were like, no, we still try to look for options and avenues to explore every perspective because I mean at the end of the day they're all going through something. So all answers are gonna be wishy washy. So I didn't have a wishy washy. Not wishy washy, but we we all both didn't just go like no, we have to it's like a compassionate answer. Exactly. <laughs> okay. okay, we're gonna do one last final case here. Okay, last case guys, make sure you guys have been commenting down below. I'm definitely gonna read them and respond to them and let's see if you got them right. So, the last case, a dying homeless man refuses treatment. A homeless man enters your hospital. Chronic gangrene, osteomyelitis, diabetes, very common picture. Doctors could tell that he had a psychiatric condition, but the patient refused to have any intervention. He didn't allow doctors to treat him with medication or submit to a psych evaluation. He claimed to want to simply be fed, given his insulin, and have a bed. He was also difficult with the nurses, throwing urine at them, making them generally uncomfortable. Yes. Doctors tried to coax him into accepting IV antibiotics, but he refused. The choice was send him back on the street, a possible violation of the first do no harm oath, or seek a court order declaring the man incapable of making decisions, essentially forcing him into the doctor's care. Where do you guys stand? What would you do? Well, what's his psychiatric condition? I would need to know that. Usually there's no step. specifics. Usually they're talking to themselves. Usually he's saying random no, stuff. No, there's like, always specifics. It's a, is he schizophrenic? But they're not gonna be, you're not going to be able to diagnose a homeless man that just comes in. Of course in I can. Something. I'll consult a psychiatry. Yeah, there's a, uh, there's <laughs> a couple of things. You, as a physician, you always have a lot more tools at your disposal than you think. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that you want to do is look at this guy's past medical history. So everything as a physician is usually in the charts if they've had any visits to the hospital in the past. And so often you can, if they're difficult to work with, you can find out, oh, they have schizophrenia and it was documented and treated in the past. Uh, so that's one of the first things I would do. And then I would get a psych eval, although it looks like he did refuse a psych uh, evaluation, but still, okay. I, that's what I read. Evaluation? That's what I read. And he's a psych condition, but the patient refused to have any intervention, which assumes he doesn't want to talk. Interventions, but Likely yeah. he won't talk to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist can do a sort of evaluation yeah. without being like 
interventionist. And I will also let you know that patients like this, psych usually does show up, says patient uncooperative, will assess at a later time, at least really? where I've been at. Yeah. Also, I feel like even involuntarily to the psych hospital I was at, they usually have a diagnosis when uh, upon presentation in the ER. When That's psych a good psychiatrist, consultant. man. Really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Usually it's more, you get psychiatry on board, they manage medications for acute agitation or something like that, and then they assess the chronic condition at a later time when they're more stable. Uh, I guess you're right. This That's patient what I would also do with is him. not stable. That's what I would do with him. What? I'd give him some help here and all, tell him to calm, get him to calm down. He's, he's not capable of taking care of himself. He's got gangrene osteomyelitis, which would probably kill him. Mm -hmm. Uh... I would, yeah, give him haloperidol, something to de-agitate him, and then probably involuntarily admit him because he's not capable of... I'd also order psych consult, but like you said, it'll probably be uncooperative. Um, and then at a later time, once he's de-agitated, get psych to reevaluate. most likely they'll come up with some sort of, um, unfortunately for his case, probably that he you know, doesn't have capacity, um, and then treat him. Uh, I would treat him preemptively, though while he's in my care. So you would treat him without doing the court order or anything like that? Yes, because he's acutely ill. He's acutely ill. He's got osteomyelitis okay. and gangrene. Okay, yeah. that's actually a really respectable answer to that because sepsis infection, one of the earliest things you could do is get antibiotics into the system. That is the number one thing to decrease mortality. Go ahead, show me. Yeah, so I basically agree. And I think this is more common than you might think in the ER. Like people like, oh my God, you're giving a patient uh, like medications when he refuses them. This is really common. And if we did absolutely nothing about patients who come in that are refusing treatment, uh, especially ones that are like uh, need a psych evaluation, then we'd be in a lot of trouble. So even at some hospitals I've seen, there's like a psych component of the mm -hmm, ER. Exactly. It's like joint um, because this is so common. So because he does have these acute conditions that do need treatment, you can't just let him back on, out onto the street. That's kind of, uh, in my opinion, that's wrong. Um, and although I have seen that happen at, like when I was shadowing college, uh, people are just like, oh, I'm sick of these homeless people. Just get him out of here. He's been here 10 times. Yeah, they'll do like um, NSAIDs or something temp, like very, you know, temporary. temporary yeah. And then mm -hmm. like you said, get them out. Yeah, yeah, but I don't agree with that. I think he does need treatment. And um, I basically agree with Benit's answer uh, generally. Yeah. Okay, so this is what happened. For a busy staff- Watch us be wrong. <laughs> there's no gray area here, actually. De obviously, you guys are spot on. Discharging this very sick man to the street to die is ethically unacceptable. The dilemma now becomes how to respect their desires to actually treat the illness. A uh, patient has the right to be mentally ill, but we do not want a mentally ill person to suffer because his illness tends to make him say no. Doctors have to determine if the man can make his own decisions. That's really key here. Mm -hmm. Essentially, by the way, just to this, especially if you're considering going into medicine, it's a good thing to know what capacity really means. It's a very, it sounds like a subjective term, but there's actually certain um, criteria that have to be met to determine if somebody has or does not have capacity. Do they understand their medical problem? Do they understand, okay, I have osteomyelitis, which is an infection of the bone, like due to a bacteria. You know, can they recite that to you? Do they understand the basics? Um, do they understand the risks of not having treatment? So, hey, okay, if I don't have uh, treatment for this osteomyelitis, it could turn step septic and I could die. They need to be able to recite that back to you. And then they need to understand what the proposed treatment doctors are trying to give them. So, hey, we're gonna give you these antibiotics for your osteomyelitis, um, this is what they're gonna treat, here's some side effects of it. Um, they need to understand what the treatment is. Um, Cause sometimes you'll even have like maybe natural, like people, patients who really like herbs, right? Um, they don't want any pills, but they need to understand, okay, this pill, this is what it's gonna do, you know, you're not, or like, and if you don't get this pill, the alternatives we have are these. Um, so they need to be able to recite all of this back to the doctor before somebody can say, okay, you completely understand that this is going to kill you. You completely understand this is the treatment we were going for, and these are your alternatives, and you don't want any of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're free to go. Yeah. So you guys were right. In this case, psychiatrists can also be called in. Um, it's also very state by state. I know in New York, you need two physicians to kind of approve to treat mm -hmm. somebody and hold them against their will in a psych unit. Um, and then, like you guys said, treating somebody that doesn't have capacity, you can do it with a court order and then actually treat them. Mm -hmm. So in this case, the ethics team enlisted the help of a psychiatrist who came in, exactly like you guys had said, uh, to see if he had decision-making capacity. She was able to have a conversation with the patient that made clear he was not capable of making decisions. 
The man allowed doctors to call his mother. She confirmed that the ment- man had a mental illness and encouraged the hospital to force him into care. The mm-hmm. hospital qu- was granted uh, the permission from the court to treat the man against his will. After seven weeks of medical and psych treatment, he was released into a chronic care facility under the supervision of his doctor, who continued to act as his surrogate. Yeah. So, bam, you guys actually were spot on with most of these. How did you guys out there do? Um, very interesting cases and it just goes to show you being a doctor is just endless angles you can take to it this is stuff you have to deal with on a day-to-day basis this is not some rare thing that happens so overall you guys did really really well shockingly i thought really some of those were going to trip you up but uh you guys did good did you guys out there have the same opinion do you even agree with this because ethics is Why something do you sound like blues clues did, did you guys get it did you guys <laughs> did you do it yes um in the end of the day one important thing to note is yes these are really really smart people that put this together and look at it from every angle but people have different ethics things are subjective do you guys agree with these uh answers or would you do something even different and what is your logic we will be looking for your comments down below guys and thank you so much for tuning into this video we will see you guys in the next one later